Kyle Kleimans on behalf of Film Speak, and uh, thank you very much to Fox Rich and Rob Richardson for joining me today to speak about their documentary, Time to Unfinished Business. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you for having for, us. Much appreciated. <laughs> um, so, as some of us will know, um, it's a sequel to an Oscar nominated documentary called Time, which details your lives in regards to also Mr. Richardson, uh, sorry, Rob's incarceration. So when did you decide that you'd make a sequel to that film? Well, I think that as soon as um, Rob walked out of those gates, for us, it was important. For me, it was important to share what would happen after our family was freed. Um, so the Oscar-nominated documentary Time, which is streaming on Amazon Prime Video now, for those that have not had an opportunity to see it, um, it ends with basically my husband coming back home and being able to greet his children. But for me, it was more important, not just that he came home, but what would we now do with our freedom as a family? And that is what I felt compelled to show the world. Um, in Time One, People only saw me and the work that I was doing to bring Rob home, but they did not get a chance to bear witness to what he was doing on the inside to ensure that he came back home to his family. And so it just um, time uh, as beautiful of a, a depiction of our family's journey as it was, it just left out so much that was important to us as freedom fighters. That certainly comes across in the documentary. It's a noble cause that you're both embarking on. Thank you, Cal. Thank you, thank you. In regards it to... It is necessary. <laughs> absolutely, from the looks of it. Um, <laughs> in regards to the documentary, the sequel, though, I noticed that uh, the first one was directed by uh, Ms. Garrett Bradley, and you directed the sequel. When did you decide that you would be the one to direct this? Well, I think for me deciding that I would be the one to direct it. Uh, honestly, I my, my direction started in the first one. It was um, the compilation of my 21 years of archive footage that actually led to time becoming a full feature film. Um, initially, when we encountered Gary Bradley and we asked her to tell our story, it was supposed to be a 15 minute op doc mm -hmm. on the New York Times website. But it was only after I shared with her my archive footage that it actually became a full feature film. And so directing is not like something new to me, um, but something when it comes to our family story, which is also the story of 2.3 million American family stories. Um, it's something that just comes innately. Um, so where some people go to school for it, um, it's just a gift that God has given me um, to be able to share in particular this mission um, or this message to other people because the message is so much bigger than just the Richardson family story. Um, agreed. <laughs> Actually, um, speaking of that, um, all that archive footage, I did notice that um, I read up a bit on the first film and there were thousands of hours of footage to go through and in the sequel, of course, that's continued the trend. I mean, you've and you've got what thirty years worth of footage to. How did you, like, how did you manage to, like, what? How did you choose which clips go into the film? Um, I think that as we were putting together the storyboard for what would actually be a part of the sequel documentary, um, we were very intentional about what we wanted to share, um, what we thought would be important to our viewers, um, showing people that it wasn't a fairy godmother that came along and helped us obtain freedom for ourselves or for other loved ones. Um, but that the intentionality that was behind it was important for us to share. We thought it was important to share in this climate um, that Rob was not just a black man sitting behind prison bars playing dominoes and cards, waiting on somebody to come and rescue him, but that he was deeply involved in his own liberation and restoration to his family. Um, also showing that even in spite of the incarceration, that love is the most divine chemical in the universe, and it 
it dissolves everything that is not of itself. So even prison walls couldn't keep our family's bond from breaking. And, you know, I just think that that is the most important of the elements that we could possibly share about our journey is that love never fails because we never fail to love as Rob shares when we um, were newlyweds. <laughs> It's a beautiful sentiment. Um, speaking of that, uh, one thing that I thought Time 2 did really well on that note was just how it portrayed the incredible bond that you two share as a couple, the way you defied all the obstacles which that you faced while you're raising this family, That and what a celebrated family it is, what an accomplished mm -hmm. family, I mean to say it is. Um, but with that in mind, when you were making time to, was there ever a separation between your relationship as a couple and your relationship as director and, for lack of a better word, documentary subject, so to speak? Oh, that is such a good, a good question. question. Yeah. Yes. I think um, probably, I don't even know. Um, I think you're just so zoned in to what you're striving to do. And I think the beautiful part about what we did in time two was the same thing I did in time one. I just documented these moments, the work that we were doing, I just documented. So it wasn't like I'm telling him, you know, say this or go there or let me get this shot. I just said, whatever I capture uh, um, as our reality, because one of the things that I learned first as I um, undertook, um, as I went into undertaking the role of director on this project, um, the producer that we bought on board, um, D Daniel LaFrance, who is a UCLA graduate and um, has his master's in filmmaking from UCLA, he gave um, me the gift of a book called Directing the Documentary. And like the first page in there, it defines what a documentary is. And, and the gentleman that is considered the father of documentaries is a gentleman by the name of Robert Flattery from Louisiana. <laughs> and, and so I'm like feeling a kindred spirit. And in there, he gives the definition that says that when you take recorded re, um, pieces. pieces of recorded reality and organize yeah. them and creatively organize them into a narrative, you have made a documentary. And so that's what we did. We just recorded reality, pieces of our reality, put them into a narrative, and we made a documentary. Wow. Uh, if if I could ask a question of Rob, um, mm -hmm. in your personal experience making the film, what was the most challenging aspect? Probably um, two parts. Uh, one of the most challenging ex aspects when you come behind such a celebrated um uh, body of work that time the first uh, documentary, you know, ultimately uh, became and, you know, is, um, you know, and you worry so. about, right, you know, and you concern yourself with, you know, how then do I come back and then do a, 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 a story that complements this one or that uh, gives uh, in a way that is worthy of, uh, of such a uh, such a highly uh, acclaimed uh, project. And um, then I guess it was in that moment that I stepped away from trying to be a uh, filmmaker, uh, producer, you know, in those uh, roles and started just saying that the natural order of what is happening in this story that we're choosing to record is pretty much going to dictate, you know, how the things go, whether they be the emotions, whether they be the tones, whether they be, you know, just all of the moving parts that make a documentary or that make a film uh what you know what we look at and 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 love in the way that we do and then probably lastly was trying to figure out uh when you're seeing yourself on screen is one thing but then when you're seeing yourself in you know just as your normal self it's kind of like fighting and when you're fighting you know uh, your adrenaline is so pumped that you know you don't feel uh, the punch that you take to your ribs, you don't feel that, you know, that you've been hitting your nose and, you know, and all those kind of things. But of course, when the adrenaline dies down, then you realize that your uh, your ribs are broken. You realize that your nose has been twisted, your lip is bust, you know, and all those kind of things. But, you know, it's pretty much the same with this and that as I'm looking back at the film, I'm like, do I really want to say that? Is it going to uh, come across the right way? Are people going to miss a uh, lead or misunderstand what it is that I'm trying to say? So it's kind of like at the pool scene, 
the pool scene was a very emotional moment for me in my reality. Mm -hmm. But to see it on the screen, it's like, you know, you begin judging, yourself. you start to judge yourself. And in judging yourself, you don't want to come off in, in a way that makes it feel as if though what you're speaking about is some type of way sensationalizing uh, uh, wrongdoing. Uh, but yet you're trying to make a correlation between other groups of people or other families of people who have, uh, um, um, I guess, done wrong, but yet they have gone down as celebrated families, you know, despite their transgressions. Um, but, at you know, at the root of it, there was a belief system about family and, you know, some other really core uh, principles that uh, that really make the families who I spoke about, um, you know, noteworthy. And mm -hmm. in it, you know, just looking at my own kids, my own sons, and then seeing them buy into, you know, many of the uh, values that Fox and I hold as a uh, as a family, you know, seeing them, uh, you know, grab hold to those pieces. It just felt befitting in the moment to say what I said. And then the rest of it, it was kind of like, OK, you have to find the comfort in yourself as a filmmaker to say, all right, I'm going to just let it out there and then let viewers decide, you know, what to pull or what to take from it. And uh, after reading uh, the article, it was just uh, crazy to see how it is that your takeaway was just what it is that I was trying to deliver in the moment. And what it was that in the reality moment, in the real moment, when we're standing out there by the pool that I'm trying to give to other people. And uh, so for you to get an edited down version of that conversation or that toast uh, that we were having uh, poolside, uh, I'm just glad to know that as a viewer, you were able to extract exactly what it is that, uh, that that I was trying to give. I was trying to give my raw emotion and be honest and true to myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I mentioned in it, it was the first time that I had ever, you know, cried real tears, you know, yeah. because uh, like I said, it was just in the midst of battle, you don't really have time to cry. You know, you just kind of keep swinging, hold your head down and, uh, you know, and just let it go. And uh, so, yeah, that's uh, those are by far the uh, two hardest parts yeah. is uh, trying to come behind a, a, a uh, a big film like uh, like Time One, and then lastly, trying to separate yourself from producer to who it is that you're on uh, on the screen. So the judgment uh, piece was big. Yeah, that there was that was a big reason, but I wanted to include that in the review because that scene hit me especially after the way you talked about how the these, as you say, the Trumps and the Kennedys, and they started off such sordid backgrounds and yet they now get to be all respectable they get to be presidents and stuff like, yeah, right <laughs> yeah the hypocrisy of the system is so right and so well put by you in that scene mm, thank you thank you Kyle. if i may though um go back to something uh fox said earlier about like uh, hinting at uh, for those of a for those of us watching for those of you watching who haven't seen the documentary yet one of the people that you two tried to assist while they were incarcerated was, of course, um, Ms. Mama Glow Williams. Um, if I may ask, what was the start of your involvement with her case? I actually met Mama Glow while I was serving time in prison, and I was just amazed because um, um, she had spent 10 years in solitary confinement. That's in a six by nine cell. Um, couldn't go out but one hour a day for 24 hours because she had previously tried to escape because she felt that the sentence she had gotten was unjust. And so when I met her, she had finally been released out of solitary confinement after a decade. And I was um, intrigued by how all the other women um, looked for her guidance and gleaned from her leadership, so much so that in the prison, they called her Mama Glow. Well, as soon as we launched our um, initiative of um, what we call participatory defense, it is we are one hub of 40 hubs across the country doing the work of this model called participatory defense, where we teach justice involved families, legal awareness as the best form of defense. As soon as we got trained, the very weekend we got our training to become an official hub, we found out that Mama Glow had a pardon hearing. Since we were six months home from a pardon through the pardon 
process, we thought, hey, this is a no brainer. We'll help bring Mama Glow home. And little did we know it would be far more complicated than we ever imagined. Mm. And um, but it was necessary. We thought that after 52 years, after 50 years, that was enough time for any crime. Um, she had left her children when they were all small. And what was most impressive to me, Cal, was that after 50 years of incarceration, her family was still by her side, her children still visiting, her sister still writing, still sending money to support, um, still taking collect phone calls. Just absolutely unheard of, of the level of commitment that this family had to her a half century into her Senate. You had at least, what, four generations of them that appeared at her, uh, pardon, her pardon hearing. 50 members of her family came from Houston, Texas, to say that they were here to support her return home. And that she was valuable. And to that them. she was valuable to them 50 years later. It's very beautiful. It's love. Love mm -hmm. knows no bound. Love never fails because we never fail to love. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Um, unfortunately, it can't go on too much longer, but I did want to ask one last thing. Can we expect more documentaries from either of you in the near future? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Until, you know, Rob and I are on a mission, Cal. We, we um, seek to be nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for the work that we are doing to end mass incarceration in America. We would make the seventh couple uh, to uh, to be uh, to be recognized uh, to, at, win you know, the prize, to win the prize itself win. as a couple. Uh, so with that being said, like Fox mentioned, uh, it is what we're hopeful for that um, that in a, a free society, a so-called free society that we have here in America, that we enjoy here in America to know that there is still uh, an, uh, a, a chance of slavery um being real for any one person that uh commits an offense in this country means that we are still very much uh a, a country that is uh still link that is still part of a of a nasty past that we once had and until we can um rectify that and make uh you know make amends of it um we'll be continuing to do this work uh, so like uh, Louisiana leads the world in incarceration and our country so, leads the world. So if we change Louisiana, then we, you know, in, inherently change the world. And um, and with that being said, if we accomplish what we set out to do, somebody might write to Switzerland and tell us, hey, these cats down in New Orleans, <laughs> they are doing something noteworthy and we <laughs> should honor them. Well, for my part, um if they can give a Nobel Peace Prize to Henry Kissinger, they should have given one <laughs> to you ages ago. Wow. They well really seen, should have. Yeah. <laughs> thank um, you, well Cal. May, I, may I thank you once more for taking the time out of your day mm -hmm. to, to uh, sit with us and talk uh, about this incredible experience and this very good documentary. And mm -hmm. I wish you all the best on your future thank endeavors. Thank you so much, Cal.